Hello all, this is Professor McCoy with your first online video lecture. Um, so this is new to me, so this is the first time I've ever done a video online. Um, so it's, you know, gonna be, you know, figuring out a little bit of the kinks in this lesson, and then as the lessons go on, I hopefully will get better at giving video lectures. Okay, so to jump right in. So this is now the, you know, after spring break, and so now we're considering uh, what we can call contemporary social theorists. So social theorists who basically lived and worked after World War II. Um, and so we kind of, you know, that break of World War II between, you know, classical and contemporary theorists. And so in this second half, we're gonna see a range of different kind of schools of thought. Um, you know, so now, unlike uh, before spring break, where we really focused on particular people, like Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, now we're going to be looking at schools of thought. So kind of like uh, general theories uh, or pr theoretical approaches to society. Um, so not just individual people, but general kind of schools of thought. Um, also, even though we're on to a new section, what we're going to see is that um, these schools of thought are actually connected to and related to um, the classical theorists. And so we're definitely going to see this today um, when we talk about structural functionalism. Um, and we're going to see it in the next lesson uh, when I talk about critical theory. So let me jump right in. Um, so today's lesson is about structural functionalism. And so to get the most out of this lesson, what you should have is you should have your handout in front of you. Um, and you're going to see me looking over to my right where I can see the handout. Um, myself that you know helping me kind of follow along. Um, you should also have your handout and that will help you understand and, and follow the lesson you know as I'm talking. Okay so structural functionalism. So what we're going to see first off is that structural functionalism is connected to the classical theorist of Emile Durkheim. So again we see the connection between contemporary theory and classical theory. And so we can begin with a little bit of a summary of Durkheim and then see how structural functionalism um, is connected, uh, to, uh, connected to him. Okay, so what was Durkheim really you know, kind of focused on? So one of the things that he was really focused on was you know, stability. How do you maintain the, the, kind of the stability of society? Right? This is the, the, essentially the problem of social order. Right? How is it that society keeps on going? How is it that even though people are kind of egotistical and they have selfish desires, how do people cooperate and maintain a, a, a degree of social order? And so what Durkheim thought in terms of modern society is that this stability was maintained through what he called organic solidarity. This is going to become very important when we talk about functionalism. And so the metaphor here of a organic solidarity was, is that, you know, just like the organs in your body have different functions, right? So your kidney does one thing, your lungs do something else, your heart does something else. Um, and each of the organs in your body has a, a role to play, a function to play. And if each of the organs does its job, then the body as a whole is kept alive. And what Durkheim thought is, well, this metaphor is useful for thinking about society. Right? And so what he thought is, well, at an individual level, if everybody, you know, now with modern society, people are very different, they're very specialized, right? we have different jobs, there's a high division of labor, and so people are doing different things. But we can have solidarity, we can have togetherness by depending on each other. Right? Even though the lawyer and the doctor are doing different jobs, they still need each other to do their jobs properly. And so, you know, just like the heart and the lungs have different functions, people have different functions, and, but they still need each other to keep the whole thing going. So he thought this at the individual level, right? You know, you know, doctors and lawyers and teachers, they individually have to keep on going. But he also thought about this as a kind of a, a, a higher level of general institutions of society, you know, that uh, different parts of society have a job to do and, and you need the different parts of society to kind of keep on going. And so we can really start here with this idea of organic solidarity, that in modern society um, keeps itself together, keeps itself stable by everybody doing their part, doing their job, and the different parts of society um, doing their function. So what happens is that functionalists, 
right? Structural functionalists, uh, a school of thought appearing right after World War II, um, really take this idea of Durkheim and run with it, right? They say, yes, right? Um, this is, you know, this is a really good starting point. What we're going to think about is that, okay, now society has, is made up of these different institutions, right? And what has to happen is that each one of these different institutions of the society now has a function to play. And if each institution of society is doing its part, doing its job, then the stability of society will be kept going and kept alive, right? And so we can think about, you know, the idea of like the education system, the family system, right? The criminal justice system, right? That society is made up of all these different parts. And again, you know, these parts have to work together and, and do their job for society as a whole to function. So this is really the idea of functional analysis, right? This is really, when, when thinking about um, structural functionalism, this is really the best place to start. So what is functional analysis? So functional analysis is really a way to try to understand why things in society exist, right? So why does the education system exist? Why do we have a legal system? Uh, why do we have religion? Right? Why do things in society exist? And what functional analysis says is, okay, we can understand why something exists by trying to understand what its function is. Right? What purpose does it play in society? If we can figure out its purpose or function, then we can figure out or understand why it exists. And the thing, interesting thing here is that even when something seems bad, Right? Even when something seems terrible, like, oh, well, this shouldn't be, you know, this thing shouldn't be happening in society. But if we find that it does exist, then functional, functional analysis, structural functionalists will say, well, because it exists, it must serve some function. It must have something it's doing. So we have to figure out, even though it appears bad, it must be doing something useful. So let's see a couple examples of this, and this will help work it out. So again, we can return to Durkheim, you know, really the forefather of this theory of structural functionalism. So this is a classic example of this is Durkheim's theory of crime. So what Durkheim said is, okay, crime seems bad, right? We, we think to ourselves, oh, you know, society would be so much better if there was no crime, if there was no robbery and murder, you know, um, it just seems like a terrible thing. But what we also see is that every society has crime. In every society across the world and throughout history, there has been criminals and there has been crime, people breaking the rules of society. And so Durkheim reasoned, well, if crime exists in every society, then it must be doing something. There must be a use to it. There must be a function, right? Hence functionalism. So Durkheim said, okay, let me think about crime and let me think about uh, what the possible useful functions of crime could be. And he came up with three um, functions of crime, right? Three jobs or things that crime does. Okay, so what, how is crime useful? One, what crime actually does is crime defines the moral boundaries of society, right? How do people in society know what is wrong and what is right? How do we know what the rules are? What Durkheim said is, okay, well, we know what the rules are by having an example of it. What's an example of rules? Crime, right? When somebody breaks the rules, when somebody murders, when somebody assaults somebody, well, that is a clear and vivid example of what the rules are and what the boundaries are, what you're not supposed to do. And so crime actually serves that purpose of showing the rest of society, okay, this is what is wrong. It's wrong to steal it's wrong to assault somebody. And by having kind of a regular amount of crime, it actually lets everybody else know, oh, well, this is what is wrong, right? So that's the first function, right? Crime allows us to know the rules of society, what is, what is good and what is bad. Second, crime actually allows for innovation, right? One important thing for society to happen is society must evolve and change. Right? You can't just be doing the same thing over and over again. Society has to keep up with the times. And so how do you do that? Again, crime, right? Crime is in some sense testing the limits. 
it, crime is often people in society saying, look, this shouldn't be wrong. This is actually a useful thing. This is a good thing. We should do this thing, right? And so by people doing the, the crime, they're actually being innovative, right? They're testing the limits of society and saying, hey, maybe this should be okay. There's some good examples of this throughout history, throughout American history. So one a good example of this is um, women voting, right? So for a long time in the 19th and early 20th century, women could not participate in the political system of America, right? It was wrong for them to vote. It was illegal. And then during the 19th century, there was a suffragist movement that said, hey, you know, this is wrong. You know, women should be allowed to have the right to vote. Uh, men and women should be equal, right? And so you have people who, like Susan B. Anthony, testing these very limits by voting, right? So one of the things that Susan B. Anthony did was she went ahead and secretly voted in a presidential election and, you know, said, hey, I voted, you know, come in and arrest me, come in and find me. And there was a whole trial. And what she did was said to people, hey, you know, we should, we should move up with the times, you know, women and men should be equal, right? And, you know, it's ridiculous that women cannot vote. And so by doing something illegal, she was actually innovative. She pushed society further and it helped it adapt to new times, right? So that's the second function of time, second fun function of crime. It helps people adapt, helps society adapt. What's the third function? The third function is almost the most important one. Crime is useful because it produces solidarity. It brings people together. How could crime bring people together? It brings people together because it allows us to punish somebody. Punishment of a criminal produces an overwhelming feeling of togetherness in a community. And we see this again in history, right? So there's some classic versions of this. Uh, punishments used to be public, right? You would flog somebody in, in, in public, you would put them in stocks, Right, you, so you would put their arms up and you would put them in the town square and people would throw things at them, right? And so this actually produced a, a high degree of solidarity, right? A community really felt together when they're saying, oh, this person's evil, this person's terrible, right? And so when people are coming together and punishing somebody, then that's when they can feel a high degree of togetherness and community and, and good feelings, right? And so what Durkheim said is, look, for all these reasons, crime is actually something really useful. Why does crime exist in every society? Because it has to exist. Crime serves an essential purpose. You don't want too much crime, right? But just enough crime is really, really useful and functional for society. Even though it seems bad, it's actually really beneficial. So that's our first example. We can understand why something like crime exists by serving the fun by seeing the function it serves. Let's see one more example. So the second example is what's called the functional theory of inequality. Right? So inequality is basically the idea that some people in society have more resources, some people have less. There are rich people, there are poor people, right? There are people with higher status, there are people with lower status. And sometimes we think of this as a bad thing. We're like, oh, you know, it's terrible that there's rich people and it's terrible that there's poor people. It's terrible that there's so much inequality. But what the functional theory of inequality says is actually um, inequality serves a purpose. If inequality is useful, right? Every, in every society across the world, there's inequality. So it must be useful for something, right? That's the, that's the way that they think about this. So what's the... What's the use of inequality? So what the theory says, it says, okay, there is a, a, something society needs to do. It needs to fulfill all of its jobs. We need to get people to do all the jobs we need to do, right? We need to have doctors, we need to have the teachers, we need to have people who clean up the trash, we need to have janitors, we need to have uh, police officers. We need to get all the jobs filled. And so the idea here is, well, how do you get all the jobs filled, right? And in particular, there's a problem with a certain portion of jobs, right? One job that you really need filled are 
important jobs, right? Jobs that are really, you know, essential to get done. And second, jobs that are difficult. So jobs that are hard to do, uh, take a large degree of training or skill. So how, the question becomes, well, how do you, how do you fulfill those jobs? How do you make sure that those jobs are filled? Jobs that are difficult and really, really important. And well, functional theory of inequality says, oh, well, what you do is you offer those jobs a higher degree of, of rewards in terms of financial rewards or just status. So let's see an example of this. Example of doctors, right? So functionalist theorists will say, okay, you know, having, making sure that there are doctors in society is really, really important. Doctors are important to maintaining the physical health of society. Um, and it's also, so that's, you know, it's important and it's difficult, right? It takes a high degree of skill and training to be a doctor. And so how do you ensure that we have doctors? How do you ensure that people will become a doctor? What functionalists here say is, okay, you offer doctors a higher degree of award, right? In terms of status and also income, right? And that will ensure that those jobs get fulfilled. And so even though inequality might seem um, bad, it actually, again, in this functional way of thinking, serves a purpose. So in general, functionalist analysis is saying, okay, why does something exist? We can understand why it exists by understanding what purpose it serves. So, you know, think to yourself right now, you know, what's the purpose of, say, something like religion? You know, religion exists in every society. And so you can think to yourself, well, okay, what's the function of religion? You know, imagine you're a structural functionalist right now. You know, what purpose does religion serve for society? I'm going to talk about this. You know, have this in the back of your mind, and I'll, I'm going to give an example of this um, in a little bit. So that's the general theory or the general approach of uh, functionalism, right? Trying to understand um, why things exist by understanding their purpose in society and also understanding in this organic solidarity metaphor how the different parts of society all work together to serve their function and therefore the stability of society maintains itself. Okay, let's move on and see now a specific uh, example of, or a specific version of this theory of functionalism. And this is the, the theory of structural functionalism of Talcott Parsons. So Talcott Parsons was an incredibly famous sociologist, social theorist that came, became famous after World War II. Um, he was an American um, and he really started this school of thought of structural functionalism that dominated social thought and sociology in, from the 50s and 60s onwards. Kind of really, really important. So what is he all about? Okay, so Parsons really wanted to create what we could call a grand theory, right? A theory of society that explained everything, right? He wanted to have a theory that would give you it all, you know, give you all the answers. And so again, you know, what is his answer? Because this is not going to sound very familiar. So what he said is that um, society is made up of many different parts, right? Many different institutions, right? He called these things social systems. So for example, we have the criminal justice system, the educational system, uh, the political system. And what he said is, okay, all these different parts, they have a function, right? They have uh, something that they're useful for. And if they're achieving their function, if they're all doing their part, then the society as a whole will maintain itself. Okay, let's dig a little bit deeper into this. So what are the functions that the institutions of society have to play? So what Parsons said is, okay, there's four main functions that uh, institutions play. And he came up with the acronym AGIL to explain this. So what is AGIL? So basically it is adaptation, goal attainment, integration, and latency. So unfortunately what Parsons like to do is he, he like to come up with all this jargon, right? He, he like to invent all these new words and create a whole new vocabulary. 
And so you have to kind of learn all these new words to kind of understand his system. It becomes a little bit jargony after a while, um, but we have to, you know, we have to learn what his theory is. Okay, so what is a GIL? What is adaptation, goal attainment, integration, and latency? Let me now go them, go through them one by one and give them give examples. Okay, so first we got adaptation. So what he said is every social system, every social system uh, lives in an environment, right? We can think about, about this as a physical environment, like so nature, you know, geography. Um, we can think about this as a certain climate right, a certain time period, right, that every society lives in a place, right, its environment. And what that society has to do, it has to adapt to that environment, right? It has to figure out a way to live in that environment um, and to meet its needs. And so one, one goal of, a, of social institutions is adaptation, adapting to the environment so that it, the needs of the people are met. Okay, what's the second one? Goal attainment. So every social institution has to uh, define what it wants to do, right? What's the goal of the society? What are we trying to do here, right? And so one uh, function of, of an institution is to say, okay, here are the goals. Here's what society, here's what us people, here's what we're trying to do. Third, integration. Integration is really solidarity, right? It's again, leading off from Durkheim, right? How do you get people to work together? How do you get people to cooperate? How do you integrate everybody to be a cohesive whole? Lastly, latency. Latency, we really can just call pattern maintenance, right? Uh, what he means by this is you need a way for the structure of society to maintain itself over time. How do you keep things going on the same as they have been, right? How do you keep the structure the same, say, generation after generation? So again, that's a, a function that society has to maintain. So he, again, he, you can see in the handout, you know, he has a nice little picture here or diagram of, okay, well, what, what are the different functions then of, of uh, you know, what are the different institutions? What functions do they play? And so he, he has a description of this. So, okay, what about adaptation? What, what, what fulfills that function? Um, he says, well, that's the economy, right? We have the economic system, the institution of the economy, and that economy, right, is basically its goal is to adapt to the resources of, of our environment and to make sure that people have food and housing and, and all the things, their, their, their physical needs. And so the goal of the uh, economy is to adapt to the environment and to provide the needs of the people from that from that environment. Okay, what about the government or the political system? What's the function of that? He says, okay, that's goal attainment. The purpose of the government is to say, okay, what are we trying to do? What's our purpose? Uh, what's our our policies? What's our laws? Right. The purpose or function of the government is to figure out the goals of society. Right. Um, what about integration, right? He says, okay, well, integration is really handled by things like the legal system, you know, saying this is, this is what we all believe in, this is right and wrong, but also things like culture, right? It's not down here, but, you know, that, this is another example of his. You know, things like culture, you know, things like TV shows and, and Netflix and um, music, that all brings us together, right? That integrates us. We have a common culture, a common set of beliefs, right? Then what about latency? Um, latency is handled by many different things. Um, you can think about the family system. Okay? So the family system, the goal of the family is to pass down from one generation to the next the structure of society. Okay? And so again, he says, okay, these different parts of society are fulfilling these different functions of AGIL. Let's go back to religion and see an example of this again. All right, so what's, what's the function of religion? That was one of the questions we had. And so we can say, okay, we can actually see that, you know, religion actually fulfills many of these different functions, right, of A-G-I-L, right? So what about I, right? This is one of the most important functions of religion. 
religion, integration, right? It brings people together, right? It literally brings people into a church or some building and, and makes us all feel like that we're a cohesive group together, right? It produces solidarity. Uh, what about goal attainment? Religion is here, what Parsons says, is to answer some of the ultimate questions of life, right? What's, why are we all here? What's the purpose of it all? What happens when we die, right? Um, what's good, what's bad? You know, religion is there to answer these ultimate questions. Religion is there to provide us with these ultimate goals. You know, why do, get, why do we get up in the morning, right? Religion gives us those answers, um, Parson says. Latency, right? Um, religion provides a set of religious beliefs that continues over time right, from one generation to the next, over hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years, these religious beliefs um, are, you know, are passed down generation to generation. So it keeps those, that structure of society, those religious, religious beliefs maintained. So again, something like religion provides many functions, right? And if religion is doing its job, doing its part, then the stability of society is maintained. Okay, so that's one main idea of Parsons, right? This uh, idea of society as interconnected systems, all connected together, um, and if they're all kind of serving these functions of AGIL. One more part. So what Parsons actually did is he thought about it uh, society as operating at a number of different levels. So at the top, what we can say is that there's the social system, right? Here's, you know, here's the, you know, sort of society at the kind of a top level, right? And so we, we can think of it as society as uh, a, as a national society. This is in some sense what he was thinking, right? So like, you know, the American society or French society, you know, that you have a self-sufficient uh, interconnected group of people who are doing a thing together, a whole kind of society or societal system. So you have a social system up here, then you have a cultural system, right? So a cultural system is a set of values and beliefs. What he said is the stock of knowledge, the stock of ideas, the stock of beliefs and symbols, right? So you can think of like a cultural symbol like the US flag, uh, you can think of beliefs, so like religious beliefs. You can think of um, ideas, just like, you know, ideas, of American values, right? So a cultural system kind of also floats around us, you know, and, and you know, we, we're also part of that. Then it also went all the way down to what he's called the personality system, right? So what's the personality system? The personality system is me and you. Right, so our actual individual self, right? Um, and so he said, okay, yeah, your individual personality, your sense of self is shaped by your society, right? And the way he talked about this is, again, with some jargon, he talked about people's need dispositions. We can really just call this our desires, right? You know, what do we want? What are we trying to get? And what Parsons said is, well, your desires are shaped by the society you live in. In particular, it's shaped by the social system and shaped by the cultural system, right? So, you know, the movies we all watch, the church that we go to, um, the society that we're in is going to shape what we try to do, right? So, if, you know, you have a value of hard work, then you're going to produce individuals, a personality system of hardworking persons. Okay? And so what he says is that your drives, your needs, your desires are shaped by the society in which you live. How is it shaped? He talked about socialization, a very important part of you know, sociology, right? That you take young children, right? You put them in a family system. Um, you put them in a social system. You put them in a cultural system, and as they grow up, um, they are shaped by that society. Their ideas, their belief, their desires, the way they live, the way they think, everything they do is shaped by that social system, right? It kind of gets inside of their head. 
And so particularly he says, you know, the norms and values of society, um, it really influences people from the inside. And if that socialization is successful, if the values and beliefs and, you know, all those things happen, then people will be part of that functioning system, right? If socialization works, then people will also play their part, right? You know, whatever society, you know, society needs a function from individual people, not just large social systems like the education system. And so what he really said is, you know, that, that you have this kind of levels of society, social system up here, cultural system here, and then all the way down to the personality system, you, your mind. And that there's a kind of connection between all these levels, right? And it's all interconnected. And if everything's functioning properly the way it should be, then uh, what you have is um, you have, you know, the whole thing maintained, right? And this is really the goal of socialization. If socialization doesn't work, what's a backup defense? social control, right? Kind of enforcing the rules by, you know, punishing people. But he says the main goal here is, is really, you know, to get people thinking a certain way. So to go back to one of the original questions we had from this class, right? What is the relationship between society and individuals? We can see here that in a, in a big way, Parsons doesn't really give that much freedom to, to individuals, right? Uh, society has a lot of power, right? Society shapes you, society has a function that needs to be fulfilled, and society gets into your head, socializes you, and you know, kind of treats you a little bit like a puppet, right? And so we, we really get this idea of, of there's a, a bit of an imbalance in the relationship between society and individuals. Society has a lot of the power, and individuals only have a little bit. And society is really working down on individuals, shaping them to get them to do things that society needs. The way to sum this all up is, is this idea of equilibrium, right? That what Parsons really thought is the whole system, the, you know, the, the complete system, everything connected together, the big social system, everything needs to be in balance. Right? You need to have things working together, you know, not too much crime, not too little, you know, um, you know, not too much religious belief, not too little, you know, everything kind of in the middle, right? Uh, everything a little bit of kind of a balance and everything kind of working together, right? And if that happens, then you have equilibrium, right? You have things functioning the way that they should. And so um, Parsons, this way of thinking um, this way of trying to understand society by understanding how the different parts work together and how all those parts have a, a job or function to play really was dominant uh, in, the, in the 1950s and 1960s in America and actually, you know, in, across the world. So we're now ending, going to the last part, right? We're nearly finished up with today's first video. Pretty exciting. Um, and so the last person we have to talk to is a student of Parsons, uh, that is Robert Merton. And so we actually have, that's what, who your reading is from, right? So the reading is actually a, a student of, of Talcott Parsons, um, Robert Merton, and he is also a structural functionalist. He came a little bit later. He became kind of famous in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and he is, you know, he also is very important in terms of adapting structural functionalism pointing out some of its problems and then kind of pushing it forward. So, okay, so what were some of the problems or criticisms that uh, Merton pointed out? So the first criticism he said is, okay, just because something exists, it doesn't mean that it's useful or good, right? The one problem with functionalism is it seem to say, well, if something exists, it must be beneficial, it must serve our use. And what Merton says, well, maybe not, right? Maybe everything is not so useful or not so good for society, right? And so he came out with, you know, some examples of this, you know, let's think about slavery, right? You know, slavery was a terrible part of society. You know, slavery was not a good thing. Slavery was terrible. And so just because slavery existed, it doesn't mean that we should say, oh, well, it must have served some useful purpose, right? 
And so what Merton came up with is, is an idea that pushes forward. He said, well, maybe some things are dysfunctional. Right? So he came up with the concept of dysfunctions. And so what he said is sometimes um, social institutions don't have a positive effect on society. Sometimes they have a negative effect. Right? Sometimes they actually hurt the stability of society. Sometimes they are they create instability. They lead to chaos or they lead to disorder. And so not everything is functional. Sometimes things are dysfunctional, right? They're problematic or wrong. And so we can see this with slavery, he said. So uh, apart from the moral objections of slavery, so slavery was morally reprehensible, right? You know, owning people was a terrible moral thing. But what Merton said is, on top of or in addition to the moral problems with slavery, it was also harmful or bad for society. It was dysfunctional. Slavery actually uh, made the South, right, the Southern parts of the America, uh, made their economy uh, not develop, right? It really kind of um, kept them in a kind of a backwards, is, you know, what he would say. Right? It did not help them to adapt to the environment. Right? And so in the long run, um, slavery was incredibly dysfunctional. Right? It didn't provide adaptation and it did not provide with integration. Right? We can remember that slavery ended up with um, uh, the Civil War and you really, you're, you're, you're having one group of people owning another group of people. That's not a way to produce, produce cohesiveness. And so for, for all these reasons, Slavery was really dysfunctional, right? So what Merton did is he add this concept of dysfunctions. So not everything is useful, not everything is good. Some things can be dysfunctional. So again, we could ask, you know, just like we did before, you know, what is the dysfunctions of certain parts of society? What's the dysfunctions of crime? What's the dysfunction of inequality, right? Too much inequality can actually reduce solidarity you know, make people very competitive, make people feel ill will towards each other. So something like inequality can serve a function of getting jobs to be fulfilled, but can also serve a dysfunction of reducing solidarity. Right? So something can be functional and also dysfunctional at the same time. Right? So Merton added this concept of dysfunction. He also added one more concept, the idea of latent and manifest functions. And this is really, to a large degree, this is what your reading is about. And it's an interesting distinction. So let me uh, you know, describe it now. So what is a manifest function? So a manifest function is the thing that people think what they're doing is going to achieve, right? It's what they see as the, the goal or function of what they're doing. Right? It's what they explicitly state. But what Merton said is sometimes things have a manifest function, but they also have a latent function, right? A hidden or secret function, the thing that the activity is actually achieving, right? And this latent function is actually the real function, right? We think that what we're doing is one thing, but actually, it's something else that's actually what we're actually achieving. So he has a nice example of this. And the, his example is that I'm going to describe is the Pueblo rain dance. So what happens is that, you know, when there's a drought for a period of time, um, Native Americans would sometimes do a rain dance, right? They would do this religious activity to try to make produce rain. So what the idea here is, well, what's the manifest function of the rain dance? The manifest function is to produce rain, right? That's what the people who are doing it think that's, that they're trying to achieve, right? That, oh, well, they're, they're dancing in order to get rain to fall, right? That's what they think is, is the purpose. But what Merton said is, well, actually, the real latent function is to produce solidarity, right? The society is, is having hard times. Right, there's no rain, there's a concern, there's fear about drought and not having enough food. And the rain dance, its function is not actually to produce rain, its function is actually to bring people together 
and to make a sense of solidarity during difficult times. An idea here is even though we might not realize this, even though we think that the function is one thing, but is actually another, that still, it still serves that function. And there's a deeper important point here that Merton points out is, is kind of suggesting. Often we do things in society that are useful in serving a function, but it's not the function that we think it is, right? It's a hidden or secret function, right? And, you know, we see this, some examples of this in terms of religion or, you know, other examples, right? You know, that the, what Merton and Durkheim would say is, you know, people are practicing religion uh, and they think it's for one thing, right, to worship God or, you know, to do or, you know, some religious service, but it's actually doing something else, right, to produce solidarity, to answer the ultimate uh, uh, questions of life. And so, you know, in heart, this is... Um, this whole theory of, of functionalism. We have, starting with functional analysis in general, the structural functionalism of Parsons, and then this um, new version by Robert Merton. Okay, that's it for this lesson.